Uh, good afternoon in the post lunch session. As all of you know, the post lunch session is a bit difficult, uh, particularly when we had a very high voltage sessions in the morning hour. Uh, however, let's see. Uh, now we are on the other side uh, of the entire discussion. If we consider this an uh, energy field and sustainability, so far our conception goes, there is a controversy in energy and sustainability. Why the controversy? Because so far we understand energy means whatever electricity, electrical energy we receive, these are uh, from thermal uh, sources and uh, all you know the thermal energy produces carbon dioxide which is a greenhouse gas and therefore more in a propensity of energy consumption means we are affecting the global sustainability but the challenge is that we need to have energy because if we consider india the energy requirement per capita energy requirement is as low as 1327 unit per year whereas we need to augment it we need to move towards a 5 trillion economy and a very very uh, within a very short span and trying to be an 8 trillion economy by 2030 so our productivity must increase our industrial usage must increase Therefore, uh, from 1327 to at least a uh, decent 2000 plus per capita energy consumption is uh, mandated. Now, in the supply side, so far we, I have been working throughout my career in the supply side. I know that sending energy to the consumers from the supply side, there you have an option of mixing your energy blending your energy at the at this point thermal with some quantum of renewable uh, although there are challenges because solar you cannot add up uh, to your sweet wheel there are also operational issues and uh, renewable we call it uh, variable renewable so there are uh, many other issues you know issues of harmonics uh, issues of power quality as we are trying to give more reliable and sustainable power to the consumers but if we see at the consumer side what are their challenges consumer are of two types normal domestic consumer commercial consumers i put though uh, i mean both the consumers commercial and domestic in one block and the third one is industrial. Now, if we see the industrial scenario of India, who are the industrial consumers? There are some big industries and there are large number of emissive. Again, when we uh, want to see their, you know, how they are focused, again, 2030 onward, it is very, very difficult to perceive that what really the focus is. Because so far I understand the focus is little bit blurred, not clear to we people who are working with the on energy aspects. I personally I am energy auditor also so whenever I spoke with some MSME or even uh, industries with within 500 uh, crore capacity they do not have much of idea that how they can manage their energy because they are happy with the present state of consumption they are getting some profit and they, that is that is their ultimate object now is is it not that we are discussing the issue within a closed frame have we uh, gone through that how far ever they are and secondly 
if we are very serious particularly as a country if we are very serious about the industrial aspect on managing uh, their greenhouse gases there should be a strong policy behind it unless you compel people for something they won't do if you put it as an option they will always take that option which is the minimum reluctance path and try to see the economic leverage they can attain from their uh, uh, type of activities uh, what miss bibha dawan was telling that is very particular that if you have uh, made uh, star rating of energy guzzling equipments particularly in domestic sector and if you make obviously the five star rating will be costlier but if you give them options of three star four star then why people will buy five star ratings five star rating uh, equipments surely not so if we are very serious on reducing ghg emission we need to carry out few activities like first assessment first awareness then assessment that how much ghg gas is being released from each and every industries they should quantify and make a target that what should be their reduction propensity and uh, <clears throat> secondly they should focus on because still we do have renewable energy which is around 45% and 55% close to that is our thermal energy that per that is at part in installed capacity and if you go by the usage capacity then again 77 to 78% still thermal energy is being used so more how much energy efficient the industries are how much what is their utilization pattern how much renewable energy they are adding up in their system how much fuel switching they are carrying out there should be a stringent auditing system otherwise this will not come up so today regarding this we do have a plethora of issues perhaps in a days discussion or in a few days discussion it will be extremely difficult for us to address all the issues but i request my other honorable speakers to highlight uh, from their point of view what can be what is their idea to create a road map for uh, reducing greenhouse gases which is particularly the most vital item for sustainability and restrict the rise of temperature to 1.5 degree centigrade all we know that it is really really ominous that we have exceeded 1.1 degree centigrade and 0.4 degree centigrade further rise is a matter of time so i uh, request uh, mr majumdar who is having a uh, consultancy background to give his view that what should be the way forward particularly in policy level and the industries whether uh, they will impose carbon taxing or not for releasing uh, uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere thank you thank you and afternoon to the audience i know post lunch sessions are difficult but i think it's still better than a in between lunch session as it happened there so at least we've got some of the audience back so thank you uh, and we will try to keep it sharp and engaging with this excellent panel you have before i start i wanted to thank bcc and i for giving us this uh, opportunity and having this uh, hopefully engaging dialogue now to the question uh, mr mukhopadhyay highlighted uh, and and as a consultant i'll kind of try to lend a framework to that right of how to look at you know industrial decarbonization or a net zero road map um i think it's also useful to look at that we as india are not alone in this journey what uh, mr mukhopadhyay truly highlighted the startling flag facts that you know we set ourselves a cop 26 target of 1.5 degrees uh, warming right which is now increasingly moving towards a 2 degrees celsius right so because we cannot so let's extend the target that's actually a very indian way of doing things huh but no so this is happening at a global level so 
um uh, so, but if we look at that startling fact uh, we have to see that some steps are happening globally that we can borrow from and i would use uh, from the sector which i belong which is the energy sector um some initiatives that have been taken by large energy companies like say a shell shell by the way had close to 80 gigatons of co2 emission right uh, annually they have reduced that significantly they've already over the last 4 years reduced that to uh, 70 71 tons right um so that that improvement has happened exxon by the way was more than uh, 100 uh, million tons and this is by the way just scope 1 and scope 2 we are not even trying to estimate scope 3 which is all the consumption and thereof uh, that is happening right um, so there is significant ways to go where you can manage your own emissions your uh, surrounding or supply chain and then finally the consumption side of your products in the value chain that would come into play right um, it is worth india to note some of the plans that is happening there now having said that uh, india has set itself j- just before i go to the india part of the story so i'll talk about global india what are some of the players doing what is our government already doing and i will end with a little bit of a sobering thought of what more needs to be done in fact i'll come to the theme of which this summit is which is net zero uh, you know in a climate justice road map which is a very apt thing because it's not about reaching net zero at any cost but net zero for everybody right and not just for some of the haves and definitely not to consider the have nots um so in that context as i talked about the global side one other aspect i wanted to highlight there is most of these um either com- companies or even the countries have taken net zero targets which are fairly sharp we are talking about be- beyond 2030 some of them have taken targets of 2040 and 2045 in that consideration if you look at india's panch amrit which was announced a couple of years back by honorable prime minister talks about india's net zero is 2070 now i am not commenting on why it is 2070 why it's not 2050 but i think it's a very able thought that there is is a target out there and is most probably a fairly realistic target i would say that right because we have to look at it in this perspective we have ambitions to be 5 trillion economy we have ambitions to be 10 trillion economy post that that requires energy and we haven't grown on our development cycle yet each country goes through a development cycle we should look at uh, you know ensuring that there is the just behavior of the energy transition that happens and i think that's a key aspect of how we have to look at that right so when we set ourselves targets we should set ourselves targets which are realistic and in the macrocosm of the entire community and not just potentially sitting in a room here in india habitat center right i think that's that is very important to look at it from that broader community framework uh, that we look at now within that framework of panchamrit you know which sets out absolute reduction uh, 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 percentage reduction emissions intensity uh, and of course overall net zero it is worth noting that some of the oil companies right some of you know clients that i work with and even many of the uh, companies like ntpc which was here have set themselves targets as much as 2040 for example ongc has set a target of 2038 uh, indian oil has set a target of 2046 of becoming net zero now these are very commendable targets uh, that have been set and having said that these are not just targets it's important to have a goal in front of you but i think in addition to what is happening in the indian context is some of the initiatives that each of them are happening and these run across and we can maybe debate many of these initiatives some of them are around energy efficiency as rightly highlighted which is across your production processes or generation processes and this could apply to power generation it could apply to refining where are your most energy consum- consuming equipment right first auditing it so that you know where it is you need to have an as is you need to have a baseline and then knowing where it is what are the alternates can you fix it can you change it right or can you go to a different process altogether right so one has to apply the scientific first principle methods to say how can you best utilize the energy you have in fact one of the uh, you know uh, I, i forget who said this but you know the best kind of uh, 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 decarbonization is energy that is least used why use something green when you can not use energy at all right so if you can save that energy imagine the amount of effort and investment that you're saving on 
so energy efficiency clearly one of the things that is happening across many of our uh, industrial companies the second is looking at alternate sources of energy right renewable of course being one it is easier from a captive setting lesser so from a consumption residential commercial but from a industrial setting it is still easier you could blend in renewable to some extent many uh, uh, of these companies i can give you again example of indian oil which has looked to change uh, the energy consumption at its fuel outlets through rooftop solar again that is an example i'm not saying it will make huge changes but it will make some change and everybody has to make small changes there also renewable being the second kind of initiative after energy efficiency there is increasing usage of uh, i would say biogas and biofuels that i think is increasingly important now this has challenges and i have not come to the challenges part of the story yet but this increasingly ensures that some of the issues which some of us will face in delhi soon by november of you know all this parali burning and all of that fodder etc that if that can be reused to create uh, biogas through digesters and gasifiers similarly it can go through uh the ethanol process uh, and now wide variety of feedstock can be adopted that right? not to say that it is going to be easy but that is another mechanism uh that one could look at then there is of course as in fact very recently yesterday only our uh, minister of oil and gas mr hardeep puri said the fuel of the future green hydrogen right so again uh, not to uh, you know escalate it too high but while it is excellent uh it still has some path to go but look at the potential and, and i would definitely highlight that the potential that green hydrogen has for industrial decarbonization it literally is part of existing industrial process it is used for dehydrogenation in the refining process it can be used in steel uh, mr debrot can highlight uh, i mean of course india does not have enough electric <laughs> furnaces but if it were to come to that process change Uh, uh hydrogen is a great uh, um, uh reducing agent right which is literally the process of making steel so the industrial decarbonization and the potential of green hydrogen and in fact not just here but let's take it further into green ammonia and green chemicals the potential becomes bigger in fact one of the things we are very fond of saying is how do we move from electrification to a remolecularization of green energy so we of course want to go to electrification so that you know we we try to get become more green electric less of of course petrol diesel but why not look at a different kind of molecule which is like a green hydrogen or a green chemical molecule right and there is a benefit to that also there are of course some costs but the benefit is it's easily transportable electricity has certain uh, other challenges of storage and battery again i'm not saying this is better than other but to reach the targets that we are looking at we will need to look at all kinds of options towards getting towards a net zero future and then i would want to highlight uh, one of the the efforts being made by the government uh, i think a lot is happening right and and it might seem a uh, a uh, uh, a broad spectrum uh, but even very recently uh, we followed up fame to with the pm's announcement of e drive which is again another 10000 crore outlay that they're doing for electrification of transport whether it's e rickshaws electric two wheelers four wheelers buses there's a significant in fact there's another scheme that just very recently came up of security uh, securitization of e bus schemes wherein as ev buses are coming up whether it's an electra or a ashok leyland etc many of the state transport corporations cannot actually buy these buses then how will you have adoption so the securitization mechanism of that ensures for adoption of this so again the securitization financing aspects of it are very critical uh, to some of these happening the government has the pli scheme for example for advanced cell battery manufacturing that is coming up there is hopefully something going to come up for electrolyzers for green hydrogen as well uh, that is already there and then of course for production there are incentives for green hydrogen the site scheme that has come up for mnre with seki being brought out as a nodal body so as you can see significant uh, you know uh, focus is there and it is decarbonization is a clear business imperative and not just a governmental or a you know societal imperative anymore that is clearly happening but while i paint this picture and it might seem all hunky dory there are challenges right financing is one aspect i talked about uh, many people estimate this to be a 50 trillion dollar shift from current economy to a green economy right that is you know not a joke right and and this is by the way an increasing pie as we are keeping adding to our uh, carbon output as we go on because what we are saying is at this point and if we add more capacity which many of our energy companies are doing 
it will keep adding to that so how do you finance this shift how do you make it affordable to all of us to the theme that i said of making sure it's energy for poor or for everybody uh, and but it's green energy right so and how do you balance that mix there how do you solve the technology problem many of these problems while we know the solutions are not necessarily known are there more scalable are there more cost effective technology out there the story has not yet been written there has to be that much focus on r and d that has to happen and bringing these elements of financing technology uh, incentives and policy i think would be a key thing that we would look forward from government uh, to come in and stay a consistent policy a lot has happened i think a key element around that would be around integration that i would want to bring in which sets the story across evs across green hydrogen across biofuels energy efficiency so it's a concerted effort that is that towards the goal that we said of decarbonization but in a just manner i think that's the kind of framework that i would want to highlight uh, and back to you uh, session chair oh uh, thank you mr thank you mr majumdar uh thanks for your uh comments and uh, i also feel in fact all of us should feel that uh, it's a very very difficult journey the journey is not at all easy in one side there are technological uh, requirements technology and the other side the requirement is finance and the third one is change of mindset that is very very important because unless people who are really affected they don't feel that they are getting affected the mindset will not change and uh, this is basically everywhere the development takes when there is a crisis period many novel things were invented on the eve of second world war and today it is again a war for our survival and i now hand over to uh, mr devabrat dutt who is of steel authority of india limited to get his view that what they are doing in assessing the greenhouse gas emission mainly uh, perhaps they are also generator they have scope 1 scope 2 and scope 3 all together and what framework they are maintaining to target net zero what his vision for future hello so good afternoon to all of you uh, as mr mahinder has already said this post lunch most of the persons are feeling sleepy but it's again we cannot because we need to protect our environment is not it <clears throat> i thanks to mr mukhopadhyay for giving me this opportunity and the bcci for sharing our thought about steel authority india limited with all of you i do not know how many of you are from steel family but if somebody are from steel family you know steel is a very hard to avoid sector with respect to decarbonization 2020 30 the why that calendar is being chosen this is because in the 2030 the un in 2015 was decided that poverty will be end by in all forms so 2030 is a year when we will see a paradigm shift to our living standards across the world as a globe now the challenges that come with respect to environment we are seeing the catastrophe what is happening across the world if you see the floods are happening you are seeing there was a lot of forest fires you see earthquakes and we cannot predict the environment that is the reasons this is the hard time that we have to fasten our belt and we have to tie our shoelaces to get ready for our corrections and unless we do the corrections we cannot leave our world to our next generations and maybe next generation to next generation so with respect to this steel manufacturing we are the hard to avoid sector because we are maximum producing CO2 emissions, the green gas emissions, which is almost seven percent of the emissions, and because mostly we depend on the fossil fuels, the fossil fuels which are being used for manufacturing of steels are available in India 
and across the world, which is much cheaper. As of now, there is no technology which can totally replace fossil fuel. As Mr. Majinda was talking about, there are many other fuels which we are thinking of today as of green hydrogens. We are also thinking of direct reductions of the RNOs, but nothing is established. No technology has come to us. We have a discussion with the academia. We are discussing the technology providers. Our consultants are always at service. But as of now, none of the steel manufacturers could break that nut to find a replacement of this BF blast furnace route, which is the most easiest truce and which can handle any sort of iron ore with any sort of Fe content. We have a big reserve for this iron ore, Fe rose, iron ore, but the Fe percentage of that, only hardly 60 percent are above 60 percent or maybe nearer to 59 percent. Much 40 percent have very poor Fe. These poor Fe iron ores, they cannot be used in any other technology other than the blast furnaces. So this is the reasons the blast furnace technology is still having the maximum controls of this manufacturing of the iron and the steel manufacturing. So normally, as in sale also, we are adopting the BFBF route. We talk about DRI, diet reducing, we talk about EF, but there also we need the thermal power. Again, the power is the source of this carbon emissions. So the either way go on, this leads to this emissions of the green gases, which is a challenge for us. We are now thinking what are the different pathway by which we can move. As the indices is already being talked about by Majindar, government has already said by 2070 we have to make net zero. But most of the developed countries, they are trying to achieve by 2050. We are also having our roadmaps. We are trying to make the roadmaps by improving a lot of technologies. But finally, we are trying to find out what is the other way, what is the way that uh, to match the infrastructure growth, to take out the economies to the third persons by 2030, and again to control the environment by reducing, by, uh, reducing the emissions. It's a big challenge for everyone. As of now, if you ask me, we do not have any direct answer to it because both ways are important. You have to produce steel for your infrastructure growth, Again, you have to reduce your CO2 emissions or the green gas emissions. So this is the most important. So after 2030, as of now, we are trying to have this roadmap. Up to 2030, what will be the CO2 emissions? Today, in India, we are emitting 2.5 tons per ton of crude steel, which is very high. The world is producing almost, they are reducing, they are producing 1.9, we are in the 2.5. We are having this, we can see the European CBAM, what Mr. <coughs> Mukhopadha was saying, this carbon border adjustment mechanism is being there because European markets they are talking about not to take the product which has an embedded carbon. So they, they are trying to prove the taxes. Our B groups are also working. They are going to implement the CCTS, the carbon credit and taxing systems, where also we have to pay tax to our products which will emit more carbons, which will have an embedding carbon. We are doing the life cycle assessment of these products to find out how much carbon the product is there which is being given to the suppliers because this is your responsibility that you are producing this steel and finally you are emitting carbons to the environment. So with all this correction methodology to be, placed in, to be in place, we need to reduce that below 1 point, below 2 into 2030 and finally to net zero. Everybody is reorganizing or re uh, recalculating their roadmaps so that they can match to 2050, which is the requirement of net zero. But it's real a uh, question for us because we do not know what exactly needs to be done. But we are also adopting a number of technologies in sale, and our new modernizations are being done also based on those improvement what is to, has to be done. The most important is the coke consumption which is being used for these productions. So the first important thing is that we have to improve our coke rate for these productions in the blast furnace. So for this improving the coke rate, we are working, what are the technologies with improving our changing of the coke ovens to the tall coke ovens, the stamp charge batteries. We are improving our, this best available techniques. We are also capturing our waste and from that we are producing our electricity so that we take the lesser electricity from the thermal sources 
we also trying to go to the renewable sources so these are the different changes what we try to incorporate on our systems so that we can improve and rather we can reduce these emissions but finally it is everybody's responsibility to reduce these emissions so that until unless we do not do it then it is very difficult to protect this environment so with this i want to say end this uh, about this topic so i hope so you can understand the, what is the challenge before us and everybody is responsible is our responsible also to take up this challenge and to bring this emissions towards net zero thank you thank you mr datta in fact thank you once again for bringing the real situation uh, to the uh, among us because it is easy to tell that uh, produce uh, more i mean reduce your ghg emission you make a very strong road map but ultimately what the product we are doing it's an indian market we need to sell it and we need to take care of the customer's capability everything has a money either visible or invisible so once we need to know that whether uh, it is marketable by product is marketable or not uh, the companies are to invest on that pattern this is hard reality so i am giving you one example because i was talking about changing of mindset in a uh, statistics i saw that the total because this is uh, under the frame of industries the total captive capacity captive generation capacity in india is around 78 gigawatt out of which 47 gigawatt is thermal power plant around 15 16 is uh, gas based uh, I, i am not very sure let me go through the uh, data Uh, around 18 is diesel based and 6 gigawatt is gas based if gas based is uh, more or less a clean uh, fuel we can presume but this diesel and uh, thermal could have been replaced by battery support because today we have the technology but no one is willing to invest that money even for you know commissioning or replacement of the old sets with a new battery and if you know the in the power system if there is a stable battery support of 60 70 gigawatt in our system for adding more variable renewable energy in our system the system would have been with the backup of battery support would have been more stable so that's a point of concern but obviously people why they will make the change unless they get any government benefit or any tax benefit so these are the areas where the industries can be benefited by changing the government regulations and putting uh, their i mean the government should change their focus how they can give tangible benefit to the industries and industries can also help in the in 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 maintaining sustainability and reducing greenhouse gas emissions there are scopes of cdr carbon dioxide removal how they will do so there are i mean if whatever bengal chamber of commerce had exhibited today if such proposals can be generated then obviously i think industries will be more interested because they can also have some fund for you know development uh social benefit that can be invested for that anyway now i request Mr. Avirub Bose, to tell his views, and uh, this is his. The, he is the last speaker, so I we want to hear his vision. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I hope I am here uh, audible at the back. Uh, I would like to thank BCC and I for giving us this opportunity to speak on this very important topic, which is going nowadays. To start with, I would just like to say that India at present is. third largest carbon emitter emitter in the world now with more than 3 billion tons of co2 being generated every year which is quite large in if you see that way so and that's why india has opted for decarbonization plans also with a net zero target till 2070 and i think it is in the first time in india's history that india has ride upon this kind of a revolution with other countries in the world because there were earlier revolutions also like green revolution maybe industrial revolution which india was never a part or or may have missed missed the bus because of various reasons 
so based on that uh, it has been the right time that the industries come to the forefront and participate in this decarbonization plans of the government and make it more amicable for the world and the people to settle in uh, if i uh, say in as a policy point of view or as a focus point of view of the industries renewables or you can say the non fossil fuels or the non fossil energy are always been has been the a target point you can say or the focus point of the industries but the problem with the renewable energy nowadays or it has been always actually that there is no round the clock energies available for that the uh, various kind of storage systems are also being developed which are in various stages whether it be battery energy storage systems whether it be pump storage system pump pumped hydro storage systems whether it be hydrogen based storage systems so these are very you can say pertinent that this come up already innovations are there the technological uh, readiness level of these technologies at various level best is already a, is at a very advanced stage where the prices per megawatt or gigawatt is reducing drastically day by day even hydrogen is being uh, like researched as a storage for energy which uh, i foresee that it will come in very shortly that as it, it is being used as storage and those hydrogen will also be generated through uh, through the green hydrogen which india has already made a target for that 5 mmtpa of hydro green hydrogen production which is it's a very huge target for the industry to come up up with uh, a huge scale of investment is required for this and then like syn gas and we will be deriving products from the syn gas which will be used in various industrial uses uh, then uh, if i go to that uh, other stage hydropower has always been a perpetual uh, kind of a non fossil fuel if you say uh, which generates energy around the clock and the, there is a huge focus on hydropower still now but hydropower has gained different colors in the point of view that the sizes are being changed uh, somewhere there are, we are going for micro hydropowers also small hydropowers also and another aspect of fuel which is coming up uh, which was earlier considered very dangerous was the nuclear nuclear is a fuel which can be used perpetual for a very long time so there has been a focus of the government in this budget also way they allocated around 25000 crores for the bharat modular reactors Uh, so we as an industry are working on the small modular reactors and micro modular reactors uh, which will be coming in a very big way in the future and it will actually be replacing many of the non fossil fuel energies as well as fossil fuel energies and it will be kind of a stabilized fuel which will be providing as a backup to the grid also so if i say in a, a way that technologically we are working on various things on various aspects so in the future it will be a mix of all these things but the main issue is uh, if we are planning for a target of 2070 as a net zero many experts say that we need an investment of more than 100 billion dollars every year which is almost equivalent to the capital budget outlay of indian government every year so that's a huge amount of money for that the industry will need very low cost financing for that and this huge chunk of money has to be derived either from abroad or from india so that's a very daunting task which we are looking forward to financing this infrastructure because the scale if you see the cost effectiveness those are being worked upon so even in future the the cost reduces for this energies by a drastically but we still will be requiring a huge amount of financing apart from that on the policy front what we think as a industry is that green taxonomy or classification of businesses or activity should be done as immediately as possible there are many industrial benchmark for this there are many european countries even european union us japan they follow a different kind of a taxonomy for green businesses this actually helps them in financing those green activities and also avoids the green washing of the activities because many a times what happens the product may not be actually green but the people may be advertising or make it it looking like a green just to showcase that they are into the green business so it's a very uh, required thing as of now today that the government should come up with a green taxonomy uh, there is already some established uh, framework for that rbi has already published a paper in a similar nature but there are some businesses or activities which are now excluded in that rbi framework like uh, uh, small uh, sorry uh, larger hydro powers and there are some bio uh, some fuels which being, which are being generated from biogas and all those things are now excluded but i hope that will also be included in the future so that uh, you can say a comprehensive activities can be included in the green taxonomy and apart from that there is another international framework where they give different shades of green to the activities so based on that also they classify it so uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, i will uh, complete my opening remarks with this thank you very much thank you in fact uh, the situation is very very dynamic uh, 
10 15 years back the electrical grid was different the power was sold in bulk now it has become much more disruptive disruptive technology has taken place so bulk power to small power the monolithic structures has bro broken so right now the consumers are becoming more and more powerful and from thermal or high quantum of hydro we are shifting to renewable although hydro will be there we are shifting to renewable which are variable in nature and again we are expecting that days ahead hydrogen will be the front runner we don't know when hydrogen will become economic but we expect that it will happen and it in the entire future depends on the uh, new generation who will be working for their own sustainability and sustainability of the globe. So wish definitely brighter days will come. Thank you. We can take two, three questions if any one of you have any. Yes. That is also we are facing water crisis because we are from DVC. Uh, we have to follow the difference not only the environmental pollution but also the specific water consumption. Food. So link related to hydrogen production, and we mostly focus to avoid the CO2. We have to electrolysis process. So what is the views on the uh, optimization of water utilized for hydrogen, green hydrogen production? These are the main issues. Uh, I am trying to answer this. Uh, see we started that the deliberations telling that it is a very complicated value chain very complicated system in fact today when we are trying to change over to a new technology it is giving us some benefit but it is definitely generating in another plethora of problems and it is again connected to sustainability we are generating good quantum of solar power through solar plants and its lifespan is 20 to 30 years and what will happen to those I mean non-performing solar plants where you are going to dump this is definitely an issue and uh, the same issue what you are talking about usage of water but I should say that we cannot keep our fingers crossed and sit idle everyone who is facing such problem should have i mean god has given brain and thinking capacity to each and every person so uh, seeing that it is my problem try to get a solution don't put it on somebody else's head they will solve it is our problem we need to solve and if we don't know we need to identify the person who can be of our help so all answers cannot be given at this juncture thank you Right. And, and absolutely rightly said because while it is an opportunity, it also throws up challenges. But I don't see them as challenges, honestly. I see them as opportunities. You said waste management, right? I'll tell you, I mean, we also work on petrochemicals a lot. One of, I mean, I can mention this is uh, DuPont. They've come up with microbial uh, organisms which actually chew plastics and come out with some resinous form that can be reused for polyethylene, right? So that thinking exists in the world. I'm not saying that answer exists for uh, solar PV cells, but there could be something that comes up. I think the idea is to look at it from a holistic framework, from a life cycle, right? This question you asked on PV cells is equally true for batteries. We are not even talking about how the mining of lithium and nickel is happening. There is a significant sustainability and decarbonization effort required there. We look at it only at point of consumption. It's an electric vehicle. There is no emission happening. But what has happened before? What will happen after? Right? That entire holistic nature of thing has to happen. 
absolutely and i think having said that i don't want to sound pessimistic as i and i completely agree with uh, mr shankar on that that some of these will be uh, solutions to be solved in the future some of it technology is already working on it just to answer your question on green hydrogen there is about 1 kg of water required for 1 kg of hydrogen right what is to, sorry 8 kg of water for one right so now what is to say it is 8 why will it not become 4 this is literally what has happened with solar pv cell manufacturing cost so some of the technologies will evolve but we need to look at it from a more holistic perspective to really look at an end to end net zero perspective So for the water scarcity which we have asked, like suppose uh, we are all, also already working with various water recycling technologies, like whether it be treatment of effluent, treatment of waste water, so so that the whole uh, net zero of water happens if you see that way. And if you see about the green hydrogen plants which are coming up, if you see uh, rightly on the map, many of the green hydrogen or majority of the green hydrogen plants are uh, planned across the coastline. So they would be using desalinated water. so so that the actual fresh water which is available for use which is lesser than 2% doesn't get affected so they will be the industries and the even the government are focusing on the desalination plants which itself is very ener energy intensive if you say and for that also we are again going for renewable and various ways so if it is a coastline uh, suppose like in gujarat or suppose like tamil nadu uh, we are we are planning to utilize the wind offshore energy for that we are trying to plan to use the tidal energy for that so that way sir we are making a mix of that so the whole energy requirement lowers down for the fossil time parallelly we don't use the fresh water for that so that is how sir we are planning for the water scarcity for the new technologies <laughs>